once again look to God in prayer. Gracious God, indeed, we pray that you would reflect yourself in and through us, and that your light would shine in and through us, and that your life would be in and be revealed in us. We thank you for all the many ways that you continue to come to us, to enter into our hearts and our minds and our spirits and our souls, and, and we are so thankful, we are so thankful and grateful for all that you do for us in Christ. Help us now as we listen for your word that, that you would speak to us, that we would be strengthened and encouraged in your life, and we make our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. As we continue through Lent, the scene today in the gospel is, is uh, Jesus is, is up in Galilee area and he gets word from some of the Pharisees that Herod is seeking to kill Jesus. And, um, and so we hear some of Jesus' encounter with the Pharisees and his word about Herod. Um, but first we're going to read from the book of Psalms and this beautiful Psalm 27 is a triumphant song of confidence. And, and the lectionary is the lectionary psalm, and it's, it's just beautiful the way the psalm works into the gospel passage itself at, at several points. Um, it's a great triumphant song of confidence that God is, God is victorious. So let's listen for God's word in Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. And one thing I asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will set me high on a rock. And now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me. And I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. Be gracious to me and answer me. Come, my heart says. Seek his face. Your face, Lord, do I seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger, you who have been my help. Do not cast me off. Do not forsake me, O God of my salvation. If my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will take me up. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. And do not give me up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they are breathing out violence. I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. And in Luke's gospel in the 13th chapter, word comes to Jesus that Herod is seeking to kill him. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. He said to them, Go and tell that fox for me. Listen, I'm casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow, 
And on the third day, I finish my work. Yet today, tomorrow, and the next day, I must be on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often have I desired to gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. See, your house is abandoned. And I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. All right, we're going to have a little quiz here today, just a show of hands. Now, y'all don't be shy because I'm going to ask the men, all right? I'm going to just say a few things, and let's see how many men recognize what I say. If I say magnolia, how many of you men, what does that bring to mind, other than the flower? Well, I hear a lot of murmuring out there. All right, how about this? I'm going to actually say two names, all right? Let's see how many men are in on this. Chip and Joanna Gaines. All right, men. How many men know who that? Oh, I saw a hand go up. Not met a few here, Nair, don't you know? <laughs> Their show's called Fixer Upper on television, right? And they get hold of these old run-down houses, and these poor couples, they're going to sink a lot of money into them. They say, yeah, we can fix it up. It'll just be great. And, you know, they do a great job, and everyone comes out happy at the end. How about Mike Holmes? You all know that name? Yeah, okay, more men are in on Mike Holmes. You know, he's from Canada. Same kind of thing. And, um, you know, he's the man that every woman wished she married, you know. <laughs> he can do anything. I mean, you know, it's just something's wrong, and it's always make it right. Same kind of thing. He, uh, he's, he's, you know, he's been around for a good while, and his career has morphed. But, uh, but when he started out, he just went in and, and kind of fixed the problems that other contractors left for poor homeowners, and he was just really good. Um, it's kind of weird. I enjoy watching shows like that. I just enjoy them, you know, seeing something go in, broken down, and watching them come in and fix it up. You know, if Jenny were here, she'd say, you watch all these shows, Jack, and you can't do anything, you know. <laughs> LAUGHTER I could maybe write poetry about it or something like that. But what good's poetry when your sink is not working, you know? Oh, golly. Um, homes that are abandoned. Homes that are, are forsaken. Homes that are threatened. There's people that, that work hard to uh, bring them back to life. Now, Ruth shared about going back to her, um, her home she grew up in in Aiken. And it's aching, right? Okay. Um, and a similar thing with me. You know, I remember, remember, remember a couple months ago, I met my brother up in Lexington, Virginia. And uh, my dad, when he was not much older than me, he bought a house outside of Lexington, about seven acres on it, really nice place, nice view. It was mom and dad's retirement home. Of course, my dad never retired, you know, but, uh, but they'd go up there and spend time. And, uh, but mom's been in Rock Hill now. She lived up there for about eight years after dad died. And it's just uh, there in the country outside of Lexington. And um, my brother lives in Charlottesville, one of my brothers, so she split time. But um, she's thinking of selling the place or maybe renting it out. And, and so there's still a lot of stuff up there. <laughs> And so my younger brother and I, we met up there a couple months ago and just started kind of working through some of the things. And um, I'm up in Lexington, you know, at least once a year. And um, through the years since mom has moved out and my dad died about 11 years ago. And, and when I go into their house, you know, the house they had, because like I said, there's still a lot of stuff there. 
and just go in the door, and it may just be me, but the house just doesn't seem alive anymore. You know, it's, it's, it hasn't been lived in now for several years, and it's just so sad. It's just so sad. You know, it's just a house, beautiful home, but it's just not alive. There's just no life in it. And maybe in some ways, is it true that, that houses that are being lived in by people are sometimes frozen, no longer alive, just persons becoming strangers moving through shared space? Now, wouldn't we all like to see our houses moving from being abandoned or forsaken to becoming habitations that are filled with life? Now, perhaps houses become abandoned because someone inside ceased listening to the voice of Christ. A Christ-less house is a house that becomes bereft of love, caring, understanding, purity, and commitment. And when we cease welcoming Jesus in, we invite the other forces to come in, the forces of confusion and division and silence and broken promises. For isn't there truly a great difference between a house and a home? And Jesus makes all the difference. Jesus makes all the difference. It's an interesting word Jesus uses in this text when he's speaking to the, to the Pharisees. He says, your house is abandoned to you. Your house is abandoned. And um, he uses the Greek word aphiomi. And interestingly enough, that, that word is used in various contexts, and, and one of the contexts that you primarily see that word in the New Testament is it also means forgiven. Isn't that interesting? A word that has such a negative con connotation in one context, and another connotation has such a beautiful and powerful and joyful connotation. It goes from your house is forsaken to where earlier in the Gospel of Luke he says to a woman, your sins are forgiven. Same word. The difference between a life and a house and a family, a church, from moving from being forsaken to being forgiven is just on the breath of Jesus' lips. The breath of Jesus' lips changes something broken, forsaken, abandoned into something filled with joy and life, just like that. He speaks about Herod in our text and the Pharisees. And in a way, Jesus stands between both of these groups it's odd to me, it's just kind of ironic. The Pharisees come to Jesus and said, you need to get away from here. Herod's trying to kill you. I'm thinking Jesus is saying, well, what are you all up to? You know, y'all are trying to do me in too. What, you want, you, don't, you want to kill me before Herod does? Is that what you mean? The irony, as Conrad would say, is immense. Uh, they both are seeking to do Jesus in. Both mean him harm. Neither wants to hear what Jesus has to say, the Pharisees or Herod. Now, Herod is just an evil guy. You know, he's just evil. He's not willing to give up his sin. You remember John the Baptist preached to Herod and um, said, Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. You just can't. And Herod, conflicted man, as the Gospels unfold his story, and uh, 
In one gospel, it said, Herod heard John gladly, was perplexed, but uh, he just couldn't take that next step to repent. And so in his drunken birthday party, Herod makes an oath, and the cost of that is John the Baptist's head. Evil man, evil. And on the other side, you have the Pharisees. Herod's not willing to give up his sin, and the Pharisees are not willing to give up their pride. The end result? It's one of the most terrifying passages to me in the New Testament. Because Jesus, Herod, finally does get to meet Jesus. And it's when Jesus is arrested and in Jerusalem, and Pilate sends him over to Herod. And... Um, you know, Herod, oh, Jesus, I've heard so much about you. I hear you can do these wonderful, marvelous things. Why don't you do a few tricks for the great Herod to amuse me and to amuse my court? Jesus, why don't you do some of these wonderful things that I've heard so much about? Come on, Jesus, show us what you got. And one of the most chilling scenes in the New Testament the scripture says that Jesus uttered him not one word. I mean, what recourse do you have when the word of God won't speak? That's terrifying to me. His house is abandoned. The Pharisees' house is also abandoned to them, and Jesus' desire is for them and for Jerusalem. His desire is for them, but their desire is Jesus' destruction. And in the end, because they won't listen to Jesus, they end up not only destroying themselves, they destroy their city and destroy their nation. Jesus says to them, you know, he says, you will not see me until you welcome me. When you welcome me, then you will see me. So I tell you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. You will not see me until you welcome me. To see Jesus. To see Jesus. That's what I want above all things. I want to one day see him. And when I see Jesus, I know that he's going to have some words with me. <laughs> uh, you know, some work that he's going to have to do on me. And I really don't want to listen to it, I'm sure, but but I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss that. For Jesus is the master carpenter who's one day going to make a complete rehab and renovation of me and all of us once and for all. And as we listen to him now, we're already a work in progress. You know, rehab and renovation is not always fun. And I have been involved in certain reconstruction kinds of things through the years. But just imagine if you were a house. If you were a house. And Mike Holmes shows up with uh, Norm Abrams and Chip and Joanna Gaines. And they're going to go in there and say, we're going to renovate you. And you're the house. And all of a sudden, they gut you. <laughs> you start pulling down walls and pulling down ceilings and ripping things out, ripping up floors, you know, just looking everywhere. You know, if you're the house, you're thinking, ah, this is crazy. I don't want to go through this. But you have to go through it if you're a house. Because there may be termites there. There might be mold, you know. The electrical could be really bad. And the plumbing, and ah, and the jo floor joists. And, you know, it's just the whole thing just needs to be reworked. Has to be done. And isn't that the picture of Lent? Lent is kind of sort of the rehab season for us. 
And the rehab is not just for our benefit, because Jesus is moving in. <laughs> we become a habitation that holds Christ and in a dwelling, as Paul said, for the Holy Spirit. The Spirit and Jesus are moving in. And he wants to get us ready. So let us welcome him. Let us listen for his voice. There's a beautiful passage in the Revelation in the third chapter that in some ways just kind of encapsulate this whole concept. Jesus is recorded as saying, those whom I love, those whom I love, I reprove and chasten. And that's the rehab. <laughs> that's the work that he does. Those whom I love, I reprove and I chasten. And he said, so be zealous, be zealous and repent. And that's our participation in the work, Lent, in a nutshell. Be zealous and repent. For he said, here I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, he said, I will come in and eat with him, he with me. And he who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. So there you go. The rehab starts. Jesus comes in. He begins to be the host. And he transforms our house into the throne room of God. The very throne of God is in your heart. Jesus finished the Sermon on the Plain recorded earlier in Luke's Gospel this way. He said, everyone who comes to me, hears my words and, and does them, I will show you what he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep, laid the foundation upon rock. And when a flood arose, the stream broke against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. Let us welcome him in. Open the door. Let us continue to hear him say over our lives, not forsaken, but forgiven. Forgiven. Let us make our hearts his home. In Jesus' name. Shall we stand together and affirm our faith as we use the ancient words?